I remember telling an aunt of mine that when I grow up, I'm going to be a lawyer. And you know what she did? She was a very sweet, kind woman and had no sense of what impact this would have. She laughed. <laughs> and I think that probably clenched it. <laughs> I would take any dare. It was a, um, a desire to try new things, to do something interesting or exciting. And if you dared me to do something that was very hard to do or impossible to do, it was uh, tantalizing, and I tried it. I determined again to try to climb the highest mountain. I thought since the door was absolutely closed to women in the uh, Wall Street firms, what are called the white shoe firms, that that should be what I aspire to. It was after World War II. Men were coming back and being offered the opportunity to finish law school fast. And so I did it in two years. The men either flirted or, or were protective or became the enemy. There were 18 women in my class, which in 1952 was a lot. It was the Korean War. And law schools typically at that time, when they ran out of men in wartime, were more uh, cordial, welcoming to women. It was an all-male faculty, and I married one of them. So, I mean, that was not exactly typical, but I did. My life ambition from the time I was old enough to have a life ambition was to be a journalist. And the greatest surprise I had back in the year 1958 uh, was to discover that the world of journalism was not waiting for me. Being a woman uh, was not the number one credential in the newsroom back in those days. And at the time, I think it was Anthony Lewis, as a matter of fact, I heard that he had attended law school for a while. And there he had his column and was reporting on the Supreme Court in the New York Times. So I thought I could just follow that example and I um, enrolled in law school at night. Despite my being uh, considered a pioneer, and in some sense actually being a pioneer, uh, my thought in law school while I was a student and for some years thereafter was that I would not have a career. My, uh, this was a stopgap measure, that is, if I didn't get married and have kids, I wanted to teach. That would be my career. And I wanted to teach law. I never had any doubt about what I would do with law. I knew was, I was going to be, I was going to do something useful and good. Looking back over those many, many years, I never really saw it as a vehicle for making a lot of money. If I didn't have an uncle who was a doctor, who had a patient, who had a law firm, I probably would have done something else. My doctor uncle really saved the day, introduced me to a man who had a modest-sized law firm who thought I looked as if I'd be useful. There were four of us. We were associates, we call associates at law uh, or in law. And th the job is that of a teaching fellow, essentially. I was the only woman in the group, and we happened to be talking to the dean. Or presumably, he called us in to say hello or whatever. And he said to us, you know, if you want to become academics, if you want to go into law teaching, you can certainly consider this a very good first step on the ladder. At least you three can. <laughs> and as I say, the fact that it was such a kind of throwaway line 
uh, tells you how how totally this this is the way it was. I sent out a lot of letters, knocked on a lot of doors. Uh, I remember one day um, being called back for a second interview at a law firm called Casey Lane and Mittendorf. They offered me a job, but they offered me a lower salary uh, than my classmates, a distinctively lower salary. Um, I said I would think about it. Uh, it was offensive, uh, but those days, I think we were more inclined simply to say thank you for rejecting me or uh, thank you for letting me know that your quota of women is none. Um, and fortunately, that very day, I went to the firm of Sullivan and Cromwell. I guess it was a neighboring law firm. I cannot imagine what seized Sullivan and Cromwell. They made me a job offer at the same salary as my male counterparts. Incredible. I never felt, uh, uh, well, I was about to say never felt any difference, but of course that would be, that would be silly. And I, I remember our litigation meetings, for example, would begin Gentlemen and Judy. It was a man's world, and we were permitted to come in and share in it. Now, you have to remember that this is before the women's movement. And for me, and I think for most of my friends, we had not yet reached a stage of, of, of raised consciousness that we were all to reach 10 or 20 years down, down the road. My husband and I moved to New Haven, Connecticut in 1956. I'd been out of law school one year. And I then had three children. So for almost a decade, I just stepped right off the professional stage. I then became restless, you might say. <laughs> it didn't work. That is, by the end of that decade or so, I was screaming to get to do something. So through complete accident, I wound up going back to school and took a history doctorate, PhD, which turned me into a legal historian and into a marketable item. I did a lot of things. I was very fortunate. Physically, I am very strong and enormously curious. I volunteered to represent soldiers who had been you know, what I considered political prisoners. I ran for office when I had two little kids at home. My husband was a uh, labor lawyer. I became a labor lawyer, I think. In some circles, that's the way I'm still regarded. Much of my early practice was with blue-collar workers. Some of them thought it was a joke, called me this, their secret weapon, because many of the adversaries thought to have a woman lawyer was still bizarre. There were all these myths about women uh, in these firms, you know, the, the reasons that they turned away women ostensibly was that the night and weekend work, uh, the fact that clients wouldn't put up with a woman lawyer, and also that you were just at the firm to find a husband. So imagine how terrible I felt having arrived at Sullivan and Cromwell, which was just a great dream, having loved the practice there for close to two years, and then marrying somebody who was at Sullivan and Cromwell. Anybody who handles career and home and children and whatnot is going to be guilty most of the time. As you know, by now this is quite tried. It wasn't so tried in my day. So what did the women's movement have to do with all this? It had to do with the way I felt about what I was doing. That is to say that it was okay. I could aspire to a career that it didn't make me a bad person. I just felt really pissy about having to um, be treated as if I became um, incapable or incompetent. When I had kids, I resented very much the thought that this made it you know, impossible for me to do other things 
my mother-in-law expected that I would go and buy thread for her. The um, neighbors expected that I would cook for the local bake sales. I would have served them right if I had. The Lippy in your case really belongs to the women at new who put it together. They were women who were mostly on welfare, who um, wanted jobs as laborers in the building of a Battery Park City, where thousands of construction workers were being hired and they couldn't get jobs. Those jobs would have gotten them off welfare. And finally, the um, executive director of that organization decided that nothing was going to work but the threat of litigation. She told and demonstrated to a group of 350 welfare mothers that they didn't need to accept society's view of them. They didn't need to become secretaries or childcare workers or social workers or anything else, that they could be construction workers and they had every right to be construction workers and that they had the ability and confidence to do it and she made it happen for them. How did we win that case? By being absolutely right. <coughs> Torturing the... Um, <laughs> the people who had been responsible for what was wrong. We got women, jobs, and we got money. And one of the cases, we got enough money for the purchase of a firehouse at a city auction to provide for a training building. We had 350 women who ended up in the case as um, collecting on the settlement. And I would say, if you wouldn't talk to all 350, that would say, Judy Vladek is my friend. Not my lawyer, she's my friend. While I certainly had suffered grievously in the early part of my career, and I've made light of it, but it was very painful, um, I was there at a moment when being a woman uh, was something that made me more attractive as a candidate for the bench. People had suddenly awakened to the fact uh, that perhaps in the justice system, or a system that called itself justice, that it would be a nice idea if there were a little diversity. The governor had said, um, Mario Cuomo in his campaign had said, he would, if he could, appoint a woman to the court. Uh, and um, I, there were not that many women of my experience, you know, all the years of um, litigation experience, and certainly not that many women on the bench from whom he could uh, choose a woman to elevate to the highest court. So that was the picture back in the year 1983. Certainly a very happy picture for me when you look back on it, not that good for women or other diverse groups. After it will be 14 years as chief judge and 24 years as uh, judge of the Court of Appeals. We've made lots of reforms. We have um, our problem-solving courts, uh, drug courts, domestic violence courts, mental health courts, a whole different approach to, um, to those very discrete problems that just can't be shuffled in the mix. People in, these, in this situation afflicted enough by their dysfunction, uh, family dysfunction. It can't be that they have to have a criminal matter in one, ca in one court and a matrimonial matter in another and a child custody matter in another. One of the ideas behind these problem-solving courts has been to bring, we're not in the world by ourselves, to bring together the agencies, the people who can help solve these problems. There's a coincidence of women chief judges and the proliferation of this approach, this kind of collaborative approach. And, and you have to ask yourself, is it chromosomal or is it coincidental? When she started to do it, 
uh, that is to make the changes that would deal with family issues and deal with the family court, which was desperately underfunded and understaffed and under-equipped and under-computerized. Um, people wondered what, what's going on. Uh, and so from that perspective, you can say yes. If it weren't for Judge Kay, it wouldn't have happened. And I think that she was interested in the children in part because she was a woman who had children and grandchildren. We were suddenly faced with the need for a dean because our dean, who had only been there for a year or so, uh, was, uh, was about to be offered the job of the presidency of Yale University. He'd done all sorts of things that needed careful guidance, and then he was gone. It was demoralizing. And so the fact that appointing a woman would clearly make a stir, as it did worldwide, could hardly have been totally irrelevant. This is Jeopardy! Colleges and universities for 400. Answer. In 1986, this New York University appointed the first woman to head an Ivy League law school. Linda. What is Columbia? Yes, Barbara Black was her name. You know, and I became a clue on Jeopardy, <laughs> which was the thing, the one thing I have done in my whole life that caused the most excitement. We brought to the school a number of women, but three women in particular who are feminist scholars. Uh, Martha Feynman, Pat Williams, and Kim Kimberly Crenshaw. Uh, and each of them, the, the, and in particular the package, uh, was, was enor of enormous importance here. People credit me with bringing those three feminist theory types here. And I will take some credit because I worked very, very hard on it. I think in those days, there was that extra little something needed. That is, that ma men who were deans, as much as they cared about this, didn't perhaps put the kind of drive behind it that I did. You can't have a student body that's 40 or sometimes close to 50% women and have a faculty that's 15% women. Uh, it's a little better now, but uh, it doesn't work out right. This would be the same with race as well, and Barbara was attentive to that and, and urged the hiring of the, the general diversification of the faculty far more than had been done previously. Much of our work right now is for women who are employed at Wall Street. The, um, very few women have risen to very high rank, and um, when they do, they become endangered. They are very likely to find themselves you know, without jobs. The uh, attorney general held a hearing on sexual harassment in Wall Street. And there were lots of women who testified as to their experiences, all of which were pretty gross. And I was called as an expert witness. And I said, I don't know what all the fuss is about. Fussing about diversity in Wall Street? Why, well, I think it's very diverse. You have white men from Summit, New Jersey. You have white men from Greenwich, Connecticut. You have white men from Park Avenue. Up by this time, people began to catch on that I was making a joke. But it is true. You do have that kind of diversity. Where I still see the gap, we, if, undeniably, more and more women are coming into the profession. I, I notice, I follow the, the statistics very carefully. I, we're certainly up around half, I would say, in law school classes, maybe even more than half. Um, then if you follow the picture, maybe 10 years or so, you just don't see that same level of achievement within the ranks of the profession. Yes, in some areas. No, distinctly no in other areas. How often do we see women lead trial counsel in major cases? Not that often. 
How often do we see women managing partners, presidents, CEOs, general counsels? It's happening more, absolutely more. But this is the year 2005. Look at the achievements we've had in so many other areas of our, of our society. Too many of the young women who come here believe that they have failed in some way. And it's the system that's failing them, not that they have failed. They're coming out thinking, oh, if I'm good and I work hard, I'm to the world's all mine. I can expect that I will um, succeed as a lawyer. The clients will accept me. I will get the kind of mentoring or advice or assistance that the boys are going to get. Not true. Some generations of women have thought, what problem? No problem. I don't see a problem. And I've had law students say that to me. Women, uh, they're wrong. The problem is there. It doesn't go away and it won't go away. I think the best thing we have going for us today is that there are so many of us. We need each other. We have each other. Whatever age we are, we should be available to one another and helpful to one another. That's the biggest change that there's been. I would like my legacy to be that people who fight for their rights are often considered troublemakers, but that the law does not require them to be supine. I'd like my legacy to, to have to do with the love of learning. It is true that we train people as well to be professionals, but the job of this school is to educate. I think of myself as an educator, and if I can be thought of that way, that's all I want. I hope that uh, I will have left the state court system in a good, strong uh, position, serving its public well, that is, ensuring to the extent possible access to justice, helping needy people to reach uh, just solutions, uh, just bringing the very best to bear uh, in the service of the public.